I've had many years as a public speaker, and uh, sometimes the, uh, the presentation, the preparation for it goes uh, very easy, uh, particularly when you have the right topic, uh, things uh, seem to fall in place. Uh, but always, whether it's, um, it's going to be a challenge or whether it's going to be uh, something that you know, uh, I've learned as the years go by that preparation uh, is key. Our topic is transformations, and so uh, one of the uh, things that I spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, preparing for to present to you is the process of, uh, of decision-making, the process of learning, the process of change. And I was thinking that uh, I could walk you through uh, a few of the different dimensions of my life. All of us have different uh, dimensions and facets to living and talk about uh, that process of change and learning and decision-making because they, interestingly enough, whether you're uh, writing a book or playing golf or sitting at a conference table making uh, decisions uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in, in the midst of a group, uh, there are certain things that, that happened. But I struggled. I struggled unusually long uh, with, um, with the topic that I had uh, prepared, not over the question of transformations because I think that's uh, very important and, and it is something that I want to talk about. But I realized uh, as time was going by that uh, one of two things was, was happening. And I've found this over the years. Either uh, I'm, I'm challenged with the topic and the preparation because somehow I, I'm just not adequately prepared to talk about it and I'm trying to do more than I'm capable of doing, or I've discovered over the years I'm writing the wrong speech. Um, I think that's what happened to me in this case. A friend of mine uh, sent me a text message uh, not too long ago and said... Um, said, uh, would you like to uh, join me for dinner? And, uh, and uh, I wrote back and said, you know, I just can't tonight. Uh, please give me a rain check. I'm really scrambling and working hard to make sure that I have uh, uh, my notes prepared for a TED Talk that I'm going to be giving. He fired back a text message and said, oh, you'll hit a home run. Just speak from the heart. Talk about your transitions in life, and it'll be great. Well, that immediately uh, set me into uh, an enormous uh, spin of confusion and guilt. Uh, <laughs> because on the one hand, once you're struggling with the topic and someone suggests something else, you begin to wonder, maybe I should think about that. But the real reason uh, for the, uh, the confusion and a little bit of guilt is I knew exactly in that instance, what I should perhaps, if not fully talk about, the topic I should broach, because he said your transitions in life. Sometimes we have, of course, natural transitions. The aging process is a natural transition. Getting married is a natural transition. Having children, grandchildren, so on. Uh, those are the kinds of things that, that come with human development and, and aging and so on. But sometimes there are and that's what immediately came to my mind, and I thought that's what he was talking about because he and I are close friends. Sometimes there are forced transitions in life. And um, I went through a forced transition in life about uh, 13 years ago. And it was really hard. I had a job that I really liked. I thought I was doing a good job. I received a lot of affirmation from people, but for all kinds of reasons, some external circumstances, but at the heart of it had to do with the direction in which I was leading and the manner in which I was leading. And while there were those who were very affirming and encouraging, there were a lot of detractors. And I was forced out of my role, out of my job. It was very, very painful. So I ask my wife frequently when I'm in a, a, a jam as to, as to the next step to take, particularly on, in matters of, or often in matters of speaking, uh, I go to her and just get some quick advice. And uh, I asked her, um, what do you think I should do? And she said, well, you know, and we were both talking about the same thing. She said, until you can finally publicly really talk about that, you're not gonna you're not gonna be as free from it as you could be. Well that was a 
terrible observation on her part. Uh, <laughs> it was not what I wanted to hear. Uh, I wanted to hear the freedom to not worry about it. And I immediately began to say, well, look, uh, here's why I don't talk. I've talked about it with friends. I've occasionally alluded to it in public gatherings. Um, I've been asked many times to write books about it. I've been interviewed about it. Invariably, uh, oh, some of the interview, uh, interviews are hilariously funny. But I found myself, as the, as the years went by, not talking about it, not wanting to talk about it, refusing to talk about it. And the last time some poor graduate student wanted to interview me as a, with regard to a, a class of, of college presidents, those who have received votes of no confidence. <laughs> Uh, I just, I just kind of shut it down and wouldn't talk about it. And so I ran through the list of questions in my mind. Why won't you talk about that? And it was pretty obvious to me. The list came very quickly and very naturally. One, because it's painful. I don't want to remember that. I don't want to relive it. Memory is a powerful thing. When you, when you vividly remember, when you go through those processes again, you, you, you relive it. That's the power of memory for good or for ill. I don't want to relive it. It was embarrassing. It was at times humiliating. And where, where there's embarrassment and humiliation, there is closely related to that is shame in the sense of having let other people down, disappointment. And I thought... I don't, I don't want to go through that. And furthermore, and this, was a, this is a very important reason for me, I don't want my current employer and colleagues and friends to think, because it's not true, that I'd rather be someplace else. I love where I am. I love my colleagues. I love what I'm doing, and I'm thankful to be here. So what happens to people when they don't want to talk about something? I, I encountered this uh, a number of years ago as a, as a young minister and then with many occasions to, to counsel with people. But I, I saw this in, uh, in combat veterans, people who have, have seen war, have seen horrific things, and they come back home and they won't talk about it. I was always puzzled about that. Why can't you just talk about it? It would help you to talk about it. Just, just let us know about it. You know, relive it. I never understood that. But I do now. Or, um, it's a common experience that uh, people have if they've been, not my experience, but abused. Again, it's the power of memory. You don't want to go through the experience again. And then there's that fear that maybe, maybe this really was partly my fault and I can't therefore talk about it. Or parents. I've known parents who experienced the tragic abuse of their children either years before or, and they didn't know about it for many years or, or in recent days, or the terrible cases of perhaps uh, uh, parents who have whose children have been assaulted and perhaps killed. You, there's, there's a certain shutting down of the, of the heart and mind. You, you don't want to go through it again. I, I heard a, a very well-known counselor say a number of years ago that, um, that in dealing with people who are depressed and or grieving, he said, you have to be careful. There are different classes and categories of people who are grieving. People who lose uh, perhaps a, a baby who's, who's lived only a few hours or a, or a few days and they knew ahead of time because that the child had a defect, there's a, there's a terrible grief there, but it's a certain kind of grief. Or a spouse, a, a woman who after years of nursing her, her invalid husband finally loses him, there, there is a grief with that, but but it's not the same thing as people who have been wronged, is the way this counselor put it. When people have been wronged, he said, or abused, um, when they think something unfair or wrong has happened to them, he said they're a different category of people. He said they need somebody 
who will sit with them and actually say, not, they're there, you'll get over it. You might be able to say that later on at a certain point, but you need to be able to say, you know, I understand what happened to you, and it was wrong. There's a powerful acknowledgement in that. And so, so in, in going through the, the process of thinking about, about this, I, I knew that in myself there's something that I don't like talking about, and it might help me, but maybe it would help others as well. I have an executive coach, and uh, this executive coach said to me a few months ago, and this is part of the jigsaw puzzle that made me change my topic for today. This executive coach said, do you realize how many times over the years, not every time, but how many times we've come back to your previous employment experience? And this executive coach said, you know, to a certain extent, you're sort of stuck here. So, I'm working to get unstuck here and, uh, and maybe share a thought or two with you in the process. What are the ways forward? I think the ways forward for, for any one of us, or, and it happens to, to all of us in ways great and small, perhaps we haven't been in combat, um, and certainly uh, I, I dare say there's no one here I pray, who's had a child assaulted and, and killed. We haven't been to those levels of trauma, but, you know, um, people who've experienced, for example, a very, um, a very traumatic divorce, they've experienced something that's very difficult for them to think about oftentimes and go through. I remember one time talking to uh, two older uh, women, and uh, they, uh, they both wanted to talk about in front of each other, their, their marriage losses. One of them had lost a husband suddenly, but after many, many years of marriage, he had passed away unexpectedly. The other one had had a divorce. And they both agreed that while the loss of the husband was challenging and difficult, that the woman who had suffered the divorce was in a different category. Every time she went to a family gathering, she had to relive. She would remember and relive the pain of it. Whereas with the death, it, was, uh, it, had, it had closure. So what are some of the ways forward? I think whether you look at modern-day research or ancient writers of wisdom, there are several patterns that are effective. They all involve movement, different ways, strategies for movement, but they all involve moving from, from inside to out. From inside to out. The thing about pain, the thing about trauma, is that, is that it's, it, it hangs on you. It's like the proverbial monkey on your back. It, uh, and and with phys- just as with physical pain, all you can think about, all you can sense, every movement you make is a reminder of the pain you're experiencing, and it's a, it's a very inward experience. And the challenge is you, you just can't get it off your mind. So all of these strategies move from in to out because as you, as you experience at least partial healing, you begin to move away from that inward focus. The first thing is just to face up to it. I had a friend years ago whose wife unexpectedly died. They had small children. And he said, and I thought it was so odd at the time, but it, it immediately made sense once he, once he said it. He said they, they went back, he took them back to the place where the family had had the family vacation the previous year. And he said, we all stood in the same spot. We, and, and in a ceremonial way, a ritual way, we stood in the spot where we had all been together the previous year on family vacation. He said, I, I, I wanted the children to be right back there and not try to block that memory or be ashamed of that memory. You have to face up to it. Again, whether the writers are ancient or modern or Roman uh, 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 moralists and philosophers or, or, or wisdom proverbialists or, or modern-day psychological researchers, there's a, a healing process in facing 
up to it. I, I think, secondly, one of the things you can do is, is name it. I mentioned this, alluded to this already earlier, but, but there's something about naming, putting a name to something and, uh, that, that allows you to interpret it, to understand it. One of the reasons for grief, one of the reasons for the, the inability to face up to something is because we don't understand it. It's unresolved, and, and we just can't face up to it. But talking about it begins to move us from out, from in to out. And then, and then when you can put a name on something, it enables you to have not complete control, but it enables you to, to understand. You put it within a larger framework of understanding. If you have a, a, a framework of understanding that involves faith, some kind of worldview, some kind of larger perspective, it helps to interpret, interpret your experience in, the, in that light. It helps you to see that you have to know that these experiences have purpose to them. That they, that they actually have a larger meaning. It's not just the, the, the experience and moment of pain itself that you can't go back and face up to. But these things have purpose. And that's one of the hardest things, I think, to realize, and that is that, that sometimes when you tell people, you know, this has a purpose, they immediately uh, think, oh, you mean it's good. No, it doesn't absolve you of your responsibility for whatever part you may have played in the, in the terrible experience you had. It doesn't absolve anyone else. It doesn't whitewash anyone else for the, for the, for the blame they deserve for whatever happened. But even with painful experiences, even with things that can rightly be called wrong or evil, even that still has purpose. I had a friend of mine, I was uh, sharing the experience with him in, in private, and he knew me well, and we were talking, and he said, uh, he said, you know, the day will come, and he spoke of an experience of his own. He said, the day will come when you'll be able to say, not in spite of this, good has come. But because of this, good has come. I hadn't experienced that yet because it was early on. But as the years have gone by, I have. I've seen it. I've felt it. I've, I've gained perspective. I've gained a greater ability to interpret what happened. And I've seen good come from it. I've seen things come from it that simply would not have happened had I not gone through that experience. Again, it doesn't whitewash others, but it makes the experience endurable. And finally, I would say, uh, realize that, that you'll, there is a future. The, the, the difficulty that many people have and, and, and even creates depression and suicidal thoughts is, is when they feel like there's no way out, there's no way to understand this, there's no, there's no future. But there, there is a future. You'll come through it not only, not only in spite of it, but with it. It will shape you and there is a good end on the other side. One of the most popular TED Talks is by a woman psychologist named uh, Kelly McGonigal. And she makes the point that stress... Everyone assumes and knows that stress is a killer. She said, however, there's research to show that stress not only kills, but it, it harms and hurts those who are convinced that it harms and hurts. But in a strange sort of way, those who believe that stress also strengthens them experience the strengthening that can come from stress. There's ancient wisdom here. Troubles bring about perseverance. In perseverance, proven character. In proven character, hope. These things can be used for the good. There's a future on the other side. And finally, realize that part of the purpose is to use that experience to help someone else. From in to out. When you can talk about it and see that experience as a way of helping someone else. You're on the way out yourself. Thank you.